Thanks for joining us on lunch. This is Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramaniam. Good afternoon. I'm Ira Dugal. Let's get you the headlines. Indian markets fall for the second straight day as earnings take centre stage. A simpler filing system, a proposed cess on sugar on the agenda of the GST Council meet today. India's services PMI improves for the second straight month in April as employment growth rose at its fastest pace in more than six years. And Flipkart buys back shares worth 2,300 crores from several minority shareholders ahead of the Walmart deal. All right, uh, let's take a look at the markets first. Half a percent lower on the Sensex. Neeraj is here explaining what's happening. Afternoon. Hey guys, good afternoon. Uh, so not a pretty day. About half a percent off for our markets. Nifty Bank is holding out element which points towards how some of the other indices might be doing. Nifty IT in particular. You will see that those cuts coming across the board. Uh, a lot of mid-cap and large-cap IT names under a small bit of pressure today. Um, there are, but it, it's a day that is marked by result reactions, to be honest. So Adani Ports, for example, has gained about two, two and a half odd percent after the numbers that came out in the fag end of market hours yesterday and met estimates on most counts, especially the revenue front. So that did okay. And, and that's percolating in a manner of speaking to what's happening at the broader end of the spectrum as well. So if you look at the key losers uh, on, on the mid-cap index, for example, Castrol is down, JSW Energy is down. I saw PNV Housing Finance too, down about two and a half, three, three and a half percent. So some a fair bit of cuts on some fairly high volumes into companies which have either just about barely managed to meet estimates or in most cases even missed estimates and they are all succumbing to some bit of selling pressure today. Uh, there are a lot of high flyers which are correcting. So Pioneer Distillery is a stock which has gone up almost one way in a vertical rise in the last couple of months. Uh, some comes to some bit of selling pressure today, down about 5%. And on the flip side, surprise, surprise, PC Jewelers is up about 20% in trade. So, well, strange things do happen. Okay, 19%. Uh, <laughs> I missed it by a couple of percentage points. But yeah, so uh, fairly volatile in its own seat way. Almost everybody, guys, that we speak to now says that it's just as a stock specific market because while PC may be up today, if you just look at what some of these stocks have done over the last six months, including companies like Balram Puccini, down about 60, 65% from six month highs. So, equal number of winners on the upside, mm. but a bunch of names which have corrected quite tremendously over the last six months. Yes, thank you so much for that. Let's move on. India's services PMI has grown for the second straight month in April. This after employment growth grew at its fastest pace in more than six years. The Nikkei India Services Purchasing Managers Index rose 51.4 50, last month. Job creation in the services sector contributes about 60% to the economy and has reflected a sharp uptick according to the research firm. All right, uh, news uh, likely to come in from Delhi. The GST Council meets today to uh, discuss three crucial issues. Uh, includes a simpler GST return filing system and perhaps a cess on sugar. Uh, the last thing on the agenda is a proposal uh, to actually buy out the private players that hold stake in the GST and network. Nikun Jori sums up uh, what is likely to be discussed today. The GST Council in its meeting on May 4 is going to discuss a number of issues ranging from simplification of GST returns to imposing a new cess on sugar. According to a proposal discussed in a meeting of state and central government officials of GST, the new proposal would be something like wherein all sellers will, all sellers will have to upload all their invoices and buyers will have to acknowledge all these invoices based on which buyers will get credit. Now, if the government finds out that the seller has not paid the tax liability, the first priority of the government would be to recover the tax amount or the tax due from the seller. In case where, where, the, where the tax liability from the seller cannot be recovered, buyer, uh, the buyer will be asked to reverse its credit by the tax authority or buyer will have to pay that tax liability. Another item on the GST Council's agenda is to impose cess on sugar and at the rate of around 5% and this comes after the government decided to subsidize farm, sugarcane farmers at 5.5 rupees per quintal since a large, of their, a large of their areas were pending or their dues were pending from sugar mill owners. Now, the third item or the third important item on the GST Council's agenda is to turn GSTN or the Goods and Services Tax Network into a publicly held company, meaning the state and the central government would increase their stake, their stakeholding further in GSTN by another 51%. 
Now, the, the, the idea behind increasing the central state and the central government stake in GSTN is that the government fears that no data uh, or the crucial data of traders should not be compromised since it's held by private, uh, private sector players like HDFC, ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank and some other private sector players. Because thanks for that. Let's move on. We're halfway into earnings season. 57% of the Nifty by weight have already reported by numbers so far. Darshan is standing by with a scorecard of how India Inc. has fared in the fourth quarter. Darshan. Yeah, so uh, for 20 companies have come out out of 50. So that means uh, uh, if you're looking at it, 50% of the companies have come out with numbers which met estimates. Uh, five of them came out with a poor set of numbers and five came out with a strong set of number. But if you look at the overall trend, you know, it doesn't give the best of pictures because what we've seen is that the number of companies reporting strong numbers has come down from eight to five uh, and has been at that level. And the number of weak numbers have actually gone up uh, from levels of three to five. So if you're looking at it, uh, the number of weak companies that we've had is pretty much the highest in the past uh, at least uh, five to six quarters that I saw. So overall, the trend doesn't seem the best at this point of time. Uh, if you're looking at the strong numbers, Ultratech, Yes Bank, TCS, Vedanta, Bharti, Airtel were the one. A lot of private sector banks and financials uh, which have significant amount of high weightages, they are in the meet estimates. While the, even the two large caps like, you know, Reliance and Maruti, uh, which have high weight on the Nifty, they are in the in, in, in in the weak zone area. Now let's take a look at some of the sectors and you can get to understand. UPL is the only uh, agri company in the Nifty. Overall, after two weak quarters, they've managed to meet the estimate. But the FY19 guidance was also very, very cautious for them. So that's uh, something that you need to watch out for. The other space that you need to watch out is basically the auto space. Uh, you know, Marty for the reported a weak set of numbers for the first time since the first quarter of FY17. So it's been almost uh, eight quarters since Maruti reported a weak set of numbers. Hero is this fifth straight qu straight quarter in which they have met an inline set of numbers. Maruti, the EBITDA was a disappointing number that actually came out. The other set was basically Ultratech, the only cement company here. Operationally strong beat the estimates. Higher volume growth was seen this time around. Cost efficiency was seen. So overall, very strong set of numbers from Ultratech this time around. Now, if you look at Reliance, uh, that was a weak number. You know, after so many quarters of inline or strong numbers, Reliance posted a weak number. First of all, the geo number was subpar, even though they made a profit. Uh, re refining margin was also weak, so, so Reliance was a weak set of numbers. Apart from it, uh, the big uh, uh, <coughs> telecom boys, so Bharti Airtel did well, you know. Uh, Africa business was strong, and that's why they came out with a strong set of numbers. But it hurt Bharti Infotel because there was significant amount of consolidation among the operators. Uh, uh, you know, the tenancy uh, uh, issues that were there, they hurt Infotel. Uh, the other pack that we want to watch is the banks. Uh, growth momentum was strong, asset quality was very strong at DS Bank, and the new RBI norms pushed Axis Bank to even uh, higher uh, losses this time around. So that was the others came out with numbers which were pretty much in line. TCS was the best number among the IT. The management was extremely confident. Uh, Infosys uh, beat the guidance but uh, lowered the margin guidance this time around. The other two companies, Wipro was uh, very, very weak. Uh, they took provisions. Uh, that hurt them. Uh, HCL Tech, uh, the guidance was extremely strong. So extremely weak, sorry. So that's why the counter has been correcting ever since. Uh, some of the other smaller companies that you need to talk out, Vedanta came out with numbers yesterday. Higher volumes, commodity price rally, all of them aiding to a strong number this time around. You have Adani Ports. Uh, after two quarters of, uh, of strong earnings, they met estimates, but uh, the volume growth was robust. Uh, the SEZ income was also decent for the company. So overall, uh, numbers not the not the uh, worst at this point of time. Most of them are in line, but the trend of you know uh, some of the larger companies coming out with weak set of numbers is something that we should worry about. All right, Darshan, thanks so much. Uh, the commodity price rally did boost Vedanta's earnings in the fourth quarter, uh, but the U.S. sanctions on Russia are proving to be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, pushing aluminium prices higher, but on the other hand, raising the cost of raw material alumina. Uh, listen in to what Vedanta CEO Kuldeep Kora had to say about coping with this volatility. Because of these uh, sanctions uh, which U.S. has imposed on Russia, and the current uh, also uh, so halting of production at Alunote. I mean, there is a, a huge volatility in the market impacting prices of uh, aluminium on the one hand, which is our top line, which is a good factor, but also, I mean, uh, uh, increase in the our input costs via alumina prices. 
But uh, our focus really is that uh, we should continue to uh, improve what is within our control and uh, two, three things will happen. Uh, one is uh, we have a alumina refinery which produced uh, one million, little over one million tons uh, last year. This uh, refinery uh, will be ramped up this year and will produce close to 1.7 million tons. So what it means is uh, that uh, additional production, uh, we will substitute imports. We need not import a high cost alumina. So this will be one positive factor. Plus, uh, in this refinery, we will also feed a substantial amounts of bauxite, high quality bauxite from Orissa itself, uh, which also has a lower cost uh, because of the logistics uh, distances. And in addition, in our smelters, uh, we are in a position to further improve our uh, power plant efficiencies, also improve our coal materialization with the uh, mines. And uh, all these factors uh, actually should uh, uh, give us uh, a kind of headroom of about $150 per ton in the cost. And hopefully, if the situation on the, I mean, alumina resolves, so that will be additional benefit to these numbers. That's Vedanta for you. Let's move on. LNG Finance reported a 29% growth in profit along with improvement in asset quality. Managing Director Dinana Dubashi hopes to bring down the lender's infrastructure exposure to 50% by next year. In an interaction earlier today, he said the company hopes to use the parents' real estate knowledge to grow their loan book. Listen in. See, wholesale finance, first of all, uh, we concentrate on very specific sectors of infrastructure, which is renewables, uh, road refinance, transmission, and also some soft infrastructure like healthcare, education, etc. Uh, we also make, uh, uh, you know, uh, very clear that uh, our concentration will be on underwriting, on advising, and on sell down. And hence, though our disbursement growth will be pretty robust, we will give very little capital, and the book growth we will keep uh, quite limited. Uh, so you will see that infrastructure, which or wholesale, which was 62% of our balance sheet a year back, is now 56% of balance sheet, and we hope to take it to around 50% one year from now. So that is how uh, the balance sheet is becoming more retail, number one. Secondly, the business that we are doing in infrastructure is quite profitable. We are uh, we expect that the steady state ROEs in this business will be between 15 to 17%. The 9% ROE that you see is, is because we are taking accelerated provisions on some of our legacy portfolio. Uh, as we completely declare in our investor uh, presentation, uh, we have NPAs of about 2,000 crores in wholesale and the total impaired asset book of about 4,200 crores. And we are uh, continuously uh, making uh, accelerated provisions in this portfolio so that when, uh, when it comes to resolutions, uh, the way now NCLT and uh, uh, the new norms of RBI have come. Hopefully, resolutions will be fast. And when resolutions come, we will be completely provided to take any haircuts that may be necessary. Uh, we expect that this process will be largely over in FY19 and FY20 onwards, even on wholesale business, we should be able to make uh, a mid-teens uh, ROE. Right, uh, sir, if you could tell us a little more about what the current mood in rural India is like and also a word on real estate financing because that segment, uh, in that segment, disbursements have risen sharply, at least in this quarter. So rural, uh, definitely the mood is positive. Uh, so both as on disbursements as well as on collection asset quality, uh, we have done very well in the rural. Uh, disbursement has grown by 97%. Uh, the growth has come from all our three segments, which is tractors, two-wheelers, and microloans. Book has grown by uh, more than 60%, uh, about 64% in rural. And most importantly, our uh, both GNPA and NNPA have shown a smart reduction 
GNPs have reduced in rural from 12.2% to 6.4% and NNPA have reduced from 9.7% to 2.6%. So overall a smart improvement both in business and collections is rural. Clearly it is a confluence of three factors. Number one, uh, good two good monsoons and expectation of one more good monsoon leading to good cropping uh, and uh, you know uh, good expectations in rural India. Number two, uh, improved spending, increased spending of government in form of uh, higher MSP, uh, more spending in MG Narega, improving rural infrastructure, uh, the loan waivers which have come uh, have clearly improved the cash flows in rural India. And last but not the least, our internal uh, focus on using the power of data uh, to improve our early warning signals, to improve early collection efficiency and also to reduce GNPA. Uh, this, this is the troika of factors which has come together and improved the overall performance of our uh, rural business. It has helped us not only in improving the performance of rural business but has pulled the overall uh, performance in terms of profitability and asset quality uh, uh, for the overall balance sheet as well. As far as real estate business is concerned, most certainly uh, we are a LNT group company. Uh, LNT is not only in real estate development, but also LNT is a builder of choice for uh, most of the developers uh, in the country. And uh, we are definitely in a good position to use this knowledge, use this knowledge of developers, use the knowledge of the subject, the micro markets that LNT has uh, to uh, differentially grow our real estate uh, book and then our retail book, uh, the direct home loan business, uh, direct sourcing of home loan business from uh, the projects that we fund in the real estate uh, development. So this is the overall growth strategy in housing and most definitely the group synergies uh, give us a clear advantage in this market. All right, uh, losses incurred due to the JP Power plant deal gone wrong has pushed GSW Energy into losses. Prashant Jain, the Joint Managing Director and CEO at GSW Energy, told Bloomberg Quint that the company plans to explore legal options now. Listen in. There was a total 750, uh, 752 crores was outstanding on JPVL, of which we have made a provision of 584 crores. And uh, so we will be, we are now working on uh, and evaluating all kind of legal options and we will be uh, deciding in due course of time. And uh, as regards to new opportunities, we continue to remain interested, but uh, we are in a wait and watch mode at this point of time. We will be looking as and when the assets are admitted to NCLT, then we will evaluate case by case basis. During the financial year, we increased the long-term PPA portfolio from 64% to uh, 75%. In the last quarter, we added 250 megawatt, uh, uh, of which 200 megawatt was with uh, uh, with Punjab and uh, 50 megawatt is in group captive. And uh, it was in contrast of our earlier guidance of 73% of long-term PPA portfolio. And uh, we are looking forward that uh, during the uh, in, in next 12 to 18 months time, uh, this PPA portfolio will increase to 85, 86%. We are already at a very much uh, comfortable debt to equity, which is one is to one. Rather, we are uh, you know under leverage. We should be uh, more leverage as a being a power company. And uh, so it's a dynamic situation. If we are finding certain growth opportunities, we will be. Uh, we will be uh, taking the opportunity to leverage our balance sheet at that point of time. Otherwise, this whatever money we, we generate, that will be going for the debt repayment. Uh, during the uh, you know last quarter, uh, we have decided that uh, we will be doing a 2,200 of crores of the capital expenditure in FI19, which will be going, which will be uh, done through the internal accruals. So, if we do that from the internal accruals, we will be. Uh, maintaining our debt uh, level at the similar level and then uh, and and uh, 2200 crores will be the funded from internal equitals. We 
will be spending 6500 crore um, on ev business in a 3 to 4 years time frame which will be funded through internal accruals uh, by way of a uh, equity and uh, equity in case uh, we are repaying existing debt uh, then uh, the fresh debt will be taken but uh, we we are confident that we generate enough cash uh, accruals to fund it uh, the entire capital expenditure of which 1000 crore will be uh, in the FI19 and um, um, we, we are evaluating all options at this point of time in terms of the partnership uh, and uh, we believe that in due course of time we will be announcing. We don't think that we need uh, uh, to raise any equity uh, at this point of time uh, given our uh, financial leverage of our balance sheet but uh, we keep our all options open in time to come. After failing to honor debt repayments, HEC subsidiary Lavasa is now working with lenders on a resolution plan. Uh, HEC chairman Ajit Gulabchand blames outstanding payments from government agencies for the stress. In a conversation with us earlier today, he said the company is evaluating interest shown by a couple of investors to clean up the balance sheet. What the auditors have pointed out is that we have got a variety of plans in order to find a resolution to the Lavasa issue. Lavasa has been stuck for the last several few years due to banking decisions, banking decisions that haven't come forth from the banks. After having decided to, to recast the loan, they did not come forth, all of them. Some of them came forth, the others backed out. As a result, the Lavasa project has been somewhat stalled for the last three years. Based on this, a new resolution plans are underway. Some new investors are also shown interest, and those are under discussion. The, all the auditor has pointed out in the report is that, 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 that these plans are there and that there have been losses, which is true. And therefore, because of the non-functioning of the project for two or three years, that there is a concern. That concern doesn't mean that is what will happen. And that, that these resolution plans are being discussed with the bankers as well. So as far as this is concerned, this is second time in this last month or so that ideas have, somebody has written something in some newspaper or somebody has picked a certain thing out of context and it has created a certain element of uh, furor in the market. So. I think we need to understand this a little more carefully. Yes, Lavasa has been having problems. Its banking solution had been reached. Some of the banks backed out of that solution after having agreed, and therefore it has been stalled for two or almost three years. And based on that, now under the new scheme of the RBI, some resolution plan is underway. Two or three investors have shown keen interest to do that, and that is being considered. And that is also what the auditor has said, to pick a part of it out of context, it has caused all this unnecessary havoc. Does that clarify the situation? Yes, sir, to an extent it partially answers the question, but I have few more for you. In that case, the, the company has reported almost uh, uh, net losses which have almost uh, risen three times for the financial year. Uh, in the event and the current assets are also exceeding the current liability by more than 2,000 crore. I'd like to understand in the event that the company has to observe uh, the kind of losses that Lawasa has seen, does that have the kind of appetite required for it? See, let us put it this way. As far as HCC is concerned, if you can see this year's, this year's performance, our turnover for the year has been better than last year. It's been 8% better. Its profit, debt profits are also better than last year. And more importantly, from point of view of monies, if you take a look at what we have, we have about, against the, you remember there was a, Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs had given an order that construction companies be paid money against bank guarantees, 75% of the money, arbitral awards that they have in their favor. As against that, we have been able to receive, we have received 1,416 crores. As of today, the total arbitral awards standing in our favor are 4,823 crores and therefore 
The, during the current year, we received about a thousand crores of awards, etc. Now these awards will be converted into cash by getting guarantees and getting 75 percent of that amount, as well as they are many of them have reached in the final stages in courts where they can be full 100 percent releases possible. So fundamentally, all the stresses of HCC have come as a result of these monies that the government agencies have not paid us on time and therefore we have not been able to pay the bankers. This has now started releasing itself and we expect the situation to dramatically increase over the next one year. For the repayment of bank loans, as we, we have restructured our loans under S4, S4A uh, and based on that and with these monies coming in now, we should be in a better position to have the balance sheets cleaned up. Ajit, good afternoon. ACC news just flashing on your screen. Flipkart board has approved the sale of 75% of its equity to the tune of nearly $15 billion to Walmart. That's according to sources. Uh, we'll try and get you more details on this one. Uh, this has been an impending deal or proposed deal for a while now. Uh, this would mean that the, that the Bunsen brothers will dilute significantly. 75% will go to a group led by Walmart um, and uh, SoftBank will dilute as well. Now, it, is, it would be interesting to note what the, the, the nuances of this deal are. Uh, the other piece to this is the uh, Flipkart's board has already, I mean, as I said, is likely to approve the $15 billion deal with Walmart. More importantly, uh, how, how this would impact the e-commerce space in India is something we'll have to wait and watch out for. But that's the Flipkart-Walmart deal. This is according to sources, 75% valued at about $15 billion. All right, we'll get you more details on that, uh, but let's move on. If uh, the clampdown on black money has benefited one segment, uh, it's uh, private banks. The flood of money uh, flowing into the system has prompted HDFC Bank to embark on a hiring binge. Uh, the lender needs more managers for its clients' wealth, and uh, Anto Anthony joins us with what the bank is planning. Anto. Yeah, so the, the conversation about how the clampdown on black money has been adding to the private banking business in the country has been going on for some time. So HDFC Bank, whose wealth management unit takes, dates back to early 2000, and which has about 250 relationship managers and about 52,000 crore in assets, they are adding another, uh, they are adding another 150 relationship managers over the next two, two and a half years, as they expect the assets under management to uh, go up by another. Uh, um, to double over the next two or three years, that is, that is to go up to a trillion rupees. Uh, for HTFC Bank, this piece is very important because that piece serves the richest clients, their richest retail clients, which would amount to about 16,000 ultra high net worth families in India. All right, uh, Andrew, thanks so much for that. That's uh, HTFC Bank uh, looking at the private wealth market uh, much more closely than they have in the past. Just one, uh, you know, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, one interesting development in the story has been that Google or the parent company of Google is likely to participate along with Walmart in the um, in the in this in this deal. That's according to sources. Nothing confirmed as yet. Uh, the sources believe that the parent company of Google, that's Alphabet, is likely to be part, likely to participate with Walmart in this acquisition. As I mentioned, it's about 75 percent valued at two billion dollars. We'll try and get get to our reporter for more details on how the story is likely to plan out. The the uh, the timeline of this deal is set to happen in the next 10 days. All right, Harsha, thanks so much. That's, uh, you know, uh, up on the site. So do go to BloombergQuinn.com to read more on that. Uh, slipping into a quick break, coming up on the other side, Battleground Karnataka. The BJP has released its political manifesto today. Uh, we analyze the promises made uh, with the political analyst Harish Ramaswamy. Sorry, I'm late. Kya hua? Kuch nahi yaar. Just working on my expansion plan. Uh, funding ka chakkar. Hmm. It is so frustrating. I feel like banging my head against the wall. No, no, don't bang your head. Cross the bridge instead. Bridge? Huh? Ye dek. La. Are... This bridge gets you in touch with interested investors. Funding happens, which means more outlets, more customers. Interesting. And what exactly is this bridge? A stock exchange created for your kind of company. Just list on it and help your business expand. Really? Yeah. Then list it. And what? What's the matter? Who's talking about it? 
चल एन एस सी मर्च साथ हमारा सफलता आपकी दी एस एम ई ग्रोथ प्लेटफॉर्म फ्रॉम इंडिया लार्जेस्ट स्टॉक एक्सचेंज व्हाइट शर्ट कितने प्लेन और सिंपल फॉक्स एंड प्लेन और सिंपल व्हाइट शर्ट को बना दे स्पेशल और फैशनेबल फॉक्स एंड न्यू फैशन वेयर फॉर मैन वॉट इफ लाकी डिस्कवरीज कुड बी डिस्कवर्ड विदाउट लाक What if the secret code to investing was no longer secret? Could the complexities of business not be so complex anymore? Decode, demystify, learn. BQ Learning. Only on Bloomberg Print. the headlines at this hour market slipped to the day's lows weighed down by weakness in infosys itc and reliance after two days of losses the mid cap index fares a tad bit better the bjp promises a farm loan waiver and a clean bangalore fund in its election manifesto ahead of the karnataka elections a simpler filing system of proposed cess on sugar are on, are on the agenda of the gst council meeting today and the flipkart board is set to have approved a 15 billion dollar deal with walmart to sell 75% stake the deal likely to close within 10 days quick check around the markets are faring some weakness particularly on the on in the, some of the index heavyweights agam is here with a closer look Well, we are looking at further declines as far as the benchmark indices go, especially the Nifty now losing out on the 10,700 mark. It's down as much as half a percent. It's the same for the Sensex, down around half a percent, uh, just below the 35,000 mark. And the Nifty Bank, on the other hand, marginally in the green. And perhaps for a few sectors which are tra- trending higher in today's day of trade, uh, we're looking at a lot of weakness in the pharmaceutical index specifically, and uh, a lot of this weakness is. on account of uh, well biocon and of course dr reddy's uh, which is bearing down on this particular index uh, that said uh, as far as the broader markets are uh, concerned they're well outperforming uh, your major indices so both the small cap and the mid cap indices are trending uh, well slightly higher actually they have given up on the the This, the gains on an intraday basis uh, i will be watching out for the information technology sector which has taken a little bit of a u turn and which is showing some amount of uh, well strength at least a, a few counters the mid cap it counters however are still trending lower especially hexaway technologies on the back of its earnings and nit technologies which will announce its earnings anytime in the next half an hour or so All right, thanks so much uh, for that, Agam. Uh, that's the Indian markets, but as we know, uh, global markets are front and center. Whether it's the turn in the dollar uh, or oil prices, global voices weigh in on what they're making of all these developments. Our earnings are very good, and I would argue unambiguously good. Not just about the past quarter, but also, you know, what they're telling us basically about future earnings. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind, number one, that we've been sort of, you know, in a pullback since uh, the first week of February, the second of February, to be very precise. And so you have to put it first in that context. Positioning was a big issue, as we argued at the time. Uh, and so, you know, we were in a pullback mode. And then the question is. we got these great earnings you know why haven't why hasn't the market you know why hasn't that really helped the market um and and i would argue you know again number of issues but predominant among them is a concern among investors that you know we are very late in the cycle this is peak earnings uh, uh you know there's cost pressure so margins are going to go down and 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 so we have these great earnings but they're helped basically by the tax cut uh, you know by the depreciation in the dollar which is going the other way rates are going higher 
there. So, my, so, so the list is very long. So in general, uh, the equities are not reflecting the current oil price. And again, it's, as we were talking earlier, it's oil price today plus the, 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 the curve, uh, which is certainly reflecting the curve. The strip is re reflecting a lower oil price than today. But the equities are not reflecting that. And I think that the market's looking for uh, a more stability of, in the current environment. And uh, is oil going to continue at this level uh, or not? Are these companies going to generate cash flow and returns? As Daryl says, they've, they've moved into a new phase. So we're very much in a transition period right now. And so either oil prices are going to hold and the equities should come up or oil prices will go down and reflect where the equities are. A structural force that should weigh down on the dollar. You have Trump, who wants a weaker dollar to help the U.S. trade position. And then on top of that, the market knows that the Fed's going to hike rates. Um, but the market is has yet to fully price in the fact that other central banks are going to start to tighten policy. And it's only a matter of time before they do that. And so all of these forces will weigh down on the dollar. And so as a result, we think the dollar will, will fall over the summer, uh, if not longer, for the coming year or so. Well, the first hike we'd look for in the middle of next year. Uh, the market currently is pricing uh, the first hike uh, towards the end of next year. But the main point here is, you know, the, the timing could be off by three months or so. But the direction uh, is, is very clear, that they are in the midst of a tightening phase. And you have to remember, the dollar did particularly well when the Fed announced its taper, taper move three or four years ago and then did its first hike. It did much less well when it's been in the middle of its hiking cycle. So the initial stages of tightening are, are where um, um, interest rates have a much bigger impact on FX markets. All right, let's just focus on the big story. Flipkart likely to sell about 75% stake uh, to a group led by Walmart, valued about $15 billion. Nishant Sharma is, stand, is joining us on the phone line with some more details on the story. Nishant. That's right, Asha. The board of Flipkart uh, has approved an agreement to sell about 70% of the company's stake to Walmart, and, and that could value uh, Flipkart at about $15 to $20 billion. And that's going to uh, report uh, by Bloomberg site and people familiar about the development. And... Uh, uh, Google parent Alphabet is also likely to participate in the investment uh, with Walmart. And the, uh, the context of the deal also says that SoftBank, which just participated last year and invested about $2.5 billion in valued Flipkart at about $12.5 billion, is also looking to exit, almost sell all of its stake uh, as part of the deal. And, you know, Flipkart has been gearing up uh, for the development. We just reported earlier today uh, that... Uh, 60% of the shareholders you know, participated in the buyback round uh, where you know, Flipkart bought about Rs. 2,300 crores of uh, shares uh, from one of the majority of its minority shareholders. So uh, uh, this looks like uh, the deal is in the final stages. And uh, now Flipkart has also, as for the Singapore filings, has become a private com limited company. Uh, the number of shareholders has also come down to about 50. So... Uh, it, it's going to be on the, la uh, the final stages, and it looks like the wall is in Walmart's court, and the valuation for uh, this deal is going to be in the range of 15 to 20 billion dollars. Thank you so much for that. All right, uh, let's uh, move on and uh, talk about the upcoming Karnataka elections. Goes to poll on uh, the 12th of May, and while it's being touted as a Congress versus BJP battle, uh, the JDS, led by former Prime Minister Devagowda and his son, uh, may have a crucial role to play in the formation of the next government. Remember, the BJP is keen to mark its presence in South India by winning in the state. Uh, so, will it be easy? Uh, in the first of our series on the Karnataka elections, Kaushik Vedya uh, tries to give us the political dynamics of the state. Here's how the numbers stack up in Karnataka and why the BJP's chief ministerial candidate B.S. Yadurappa is so important to the party's fortunes. Here's how Karnataka voted in 2013. 122 seats for the Congress, 40 to the BJP, 40 to the JDS. Five years before that, in 2008, it was the BJP under Yadurappa that formed the government with 110 seats and the support of a few outsiders. So what happened from 2008 to 2013? By 2013, Yadurappa was out of the BJP. The mining Reddy brothers were out of the BJP. So were their associates. What happened as a result? They cut into the BJP's vote a lot. The central Karnataka region, that's Shimoga where Yadurappa comes from, and that's Bellary where the Reddy brothers come from. See that from 2008 to 2013, much of that got wiped out for the BJP. You had two other regions that the BJP for, fared worse in. That's the Bangalore region, that's Bangalore City in and around it, and the central, the coastal Karnataka region that the BJP lost support in in 2013. The Yadurappa 
return to the BJP was before the Lok Sabha election of 2014. And the Reddy brothers are present in the BJP in this election as well. Two of those brothers have tickets given to them and six of their associates have been as well. So that's a double-edged sword. The cloud that these leaders bring back to Central Karnataka for the BJP, but at the cost of their past record being questioned by the rivals. For the Congress, this is a two-front battle. In North Karnataka and Central Karnataka, the Congress is fighting the BJP, and in South Karnataka, it's fighting the JDS. So what's Chief Minister, uh, Chief, Chief Minister Sidharamaya doing? He's fighting from one seat from Mysore district, the Chamundeshwari in the south, and one seat from the north in Badami in Belgaon district. So it's a two-front battle for the Congress, remember. The halfway mark for Karnataka is 112, 113. So if either fails to reach that mark, this JDS number, watch that closely on the 15th, that could be the difference. Roshik, thank you for that. Well, BJP released its political manifesto in Karnataka today. Not surprisingly, the focus is more on the farmer, um, the party promising a farm loan waiver, insurance scheme for landless agricultural labourers. There are some schemes aimed at uh, women voters as well. So will these promises prove enough to see the BJP through in Karnataka or will the corruption charges on the Reddy brothers and Yadurapa uh, pre prove to be insurmountable? Uh, to talk about this, on what is turning out to be a fascinating election contest. Uh, professor and analyst at uh, Karnataka University, Harish Ramaswamy. Uh, Harish, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my first question okay. to you is, what, you. What, do you, what to your mind are the key election issues in Karnataka this time? And whatever we've seen out of the BJP's manifesto, does it address any of these issues at all? See, in Karnataka, currently, the major issues are uh, infrastructure, and then in North Karnataka, the regional imbalance that has to be settled. And then, of course, a bit of corruption, which you can't rule out because at the common man's level, this is a problem. And finally, of course, we have the problem of, you know, uh, this education and then higher education, skill development, unemployment, and all these things. Now, uh, the Congress government has done so much in the from past four years to support the pro-poor policies and see that the poverty-stricken people and then because of the two drought situations, migration doesn't happen. Now, the BJP agenda uh, has been sort of inconsistent. You know, when they were in power, they tried to give some bhagyas, which was much against their agenda, their manifesto, because they were talking about urban-centric uh, politics. But then, now they are talking in terms of providing some benefits, you know, the subs for the ordinary. Now, this problem continues to haunt Karnataka because whenever a political party contests an election, they think, you know, they will have to give more subs and they try to promise too many things. But then, uh, you know, as it has already been said, the crisis of governance is you don't promise certain things which you cannot do. I don't think they are being practical in this regard. Okay, so you've seen a bit of a vitriolic campaign with the prime minister upping the ante in the in in the on the on the ground in Karnataka, uh, Harish. Uh, so, so was the case with Rahul Gandhi. Uh, my question is, what's been the biggest emotive issue? D did, d will the Lingayat issue, for instance, uh, have electoral ramifications? Uh, would this be about the, the last-minute Hindutva rabble rousing that's taking place in Karnataka? Uh, what's what's the current headline? You know, actually, before Modi came down, uh, there was a feeling that Modi's presence would, uh, you know, change the discourse. But then, uh, in the first two speeches itself, we could make out that Modi did not have anything new to say. Uh, it was almost what he had already said, and then we were, he was repeating the same things. Now, the only agenda that uh, the BJP has been consistently banking upon is the Hindu consolidation. And that's what they are trying again. Because in the light of what happened with the Veerashiva Lingayat issue, there was a clear support for Congress in, from the Lingayat group. And then the BJP was silent at that point of time, and they did not speak. Now, they do not have any other uh, instrument. Perhaps you, as you know, the RSS within its own uh, study has given a clear report to Misha saying that if they go in tits and bits, they will not be able to make it very good for the you know, assembly. Hmm. Now, on the contrary, Congress has been setting the agenda, and uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi has, you know, bettered himself, has been much more impressive uh, in his conversations and the way he is addressing the issues. 
Now, uh, he has raised uh, very uh, similar questions, but then they're very sensitive. Like, for example, the corrupt people uh, within the BJP and also the questions of, you know, why big promises are made and not fulfilled. And he is also raising and connecting it to the central government. So these are some of the problems which BJP has not been able to answer. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this time around, BJP has not been able to set the agenda. It has become defensive. That's one of the major problems that we see here. Okay. Most of the opinion polls seem to suggest that it's going to be a slightly tight contest between the BJP and the Congress, although the BJP seems to be gaining in terms of both uh, percentage of votes and the, the number of seats it might, it might win. My question is, how? what would be the role of the JDS in all of this? Uh, is, is the JDS, is Devagoda likely to play the king maker this time? Now, initially, when the election started, there was a feeling that JDS was, JDS was not a player at all. And then it was a two-party contest. If it was a two-party contest, as you rightly pointed out, the consistency between uh, the percentage of voting and the percentage of seats won is in favor of BJP and not in favor of Congress. As a result, you would see from 1994 onwards, BJP has been gaining ground in Karnataka. And this is uh, much more positive if only two parties contest. But wherever three parties come into picture, it is the Congress which is benefiting although they don't have the consistency between the two, uh, that is the votes polled and the seats gained, uh, there you find that there is a difference. So JDS increasingly, with its uh, you know, alliance with BSP, has been able to make some mark in the southern part of Karnataka, especially in Kollegal and uh, Chamaranagar region, where you have the Shadukas population is more in number. And then if you come towards uh, the middle Karnataka, they have been quite silent because they did not speak anything about Virusha Bilingar. But in North Karnataka, JDS is also trying to make a headway, which is quite difficult. Uh, but then they have also tried to have uh, alliance with other minority parties uh, that might, in a way, help them. Because, you know, JDS has been, in a way, uh, a kind of a second home for the minority Muslims. Mm. And therefore, they would look forward for that. And that's one of the reasons you find that uh, Chief Minister Sidramaya went on to say mm. that there is an alliance between, uh, silent alliance between JDS and then BJP, which uh, knowingly or unknowingly was endorsed by Prime Minister when he came to Udupi. Mm. But in this uh, round of tour, he tried to decry that and say JDS is not a player and JDS is not going to win any seats. Mm. But all said and done. Mm. It is possible that uh, in the current scenario, mm. JDS is likely to play, play a very important role. Harish Ram Swami, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Anil, for joining us with your views. That's the view Thank in Karnataka. Thank you, sir. Uh, elections on the 12th, results will be out on the 15th. All right, meantime, it may be coincidental or it may not, uh, but fuel retailers have not been hiking retail prices over the last few days. Uh, while there's no official confirmation of any commu communication from the government to oil companies not to do so, uh, but the move uh, may have been triggered by uh, the upcoming Karnataka elections. That's uh, guesswork, but it's educated guesswork there. Uh, remember, the last time OMCs kept rates unchanged for a long period of time was in the lead up to uh, the Gujarat elections. Uh, all of this means that fuel retailers uh, will take a hit on their market margins. Uh, Samit Sarkar gives us the numbers. If you see the core marketing habit of all the three state-owned oil marketing companies declined in the third quarter compared to the previous quarter. Indian oil's mar core marketing EBITDA declined by close to 6% while that of BPCL turned negative. HPCL's core marketing EBITDA declined by close to 47% compared to the second quarter of financial year 2018. Now, why it declined in this quarter? Because of the weak gross marketing margins. Now, if you see in this chart, the gross marketing margin, that is the markup that the state-owned oil marketing companies earn on sale of every liter of petrol and diesel had declined ahead of the Gujarat elections. Now, in the month of October, the gross marketing margin on diesel declined by close to 26 percent then it followed by a decline of another four percent and then in the month of December it declined by as much as 41 percent while the marketing margins earned on the sale of petrol remained flat in the month of October followed by a decline of close to 23 percent and then in the month of December compared to November it declined by around 50 percent now the, because of these weak gross marketing margins we had seen a weakness in the core marketing habitat however post that in the first three months of 2018 that is in January February and March, we had seen a steady rise in the core, uh, in the cross marketing margins 
of the oil marketing companies. But again, in the month of April, we are seeing a decline. Now, for diesel and petrol, it has declined by 14% and 12%. And in the month of May, so far, that is for the first four days, the gross marketing margins have averaged around two rupees per liter versus three rupees per liter that was in, uh, that was earned in the month of April. So we are already seeing a decline, and we are seeing a similar trend what we saw during the Gujarat elections that is a decline in the gross marketing margins now whom will it impact the most well it, it will it will impact the most to HPCL because the core marketing segment contributes nearly 55 percent to the total EBITDA of HPCL while that uh, while for BPCL it contributes nearly 45 percent and for Indian oil corporation it contributes nearly 20 percent to the total EBITDA and what will be the impact well according to Kotak securities every 50 percent drop in the gross marketing margins earned by these oil marketing companies will put, bring down the annual EPS of HP sale by close to 21% while that of BP sale will come down by 16% and Indian Oil Corporation will come down by 12%. So a 50% or 50 percent drop in the gross marketing margin will bring down the annual EPS of Indian Oil Corporation, BP sale and HP sale by 12 to 21%. So, I mean, thank you for that. Uh, the U.S. has tempered expectations of a major breakthrough from the trade talks with China. Discussions are expected to focus on U.S. concerns over China's state-driven economy, forced technology transfers, and America's widening trade deficit with China. And speaking about that deficit, the U.S. Commerce Department reported that America's merchandise trade GDP uh, trade, trade gap with China has widened by 16% to over $91 billion in the first quarter. Bloomberg's Kevin Chirili reports on the trade talks between the two largest economies in the world. Six key issues have emerged from the administration's perspective as the topics for the negotiations with China as the share of tariffs led, of course, by Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin touch down in China. Of course, they're going to be talking about technology, steel over capacity, market access, the U.S. trade deficit, something that we've heard a lot about from not only Secretary Mnuchin, but also Peter Navarro, someone who is accompanying Secretary Mnuchin on this trip, who has more of a nationalistic perspective. The Chinese state-driven economy Economy and market manipulation. Look, President Trump has consistently said that that deficit is something that he wants to bring down. And just a few weeks before the president is likely going to meet with North Korea dictator Kim Jong-un, expect national security and China's role in the Korean peninsula to also come up. But how are the Chinese responding to what quite candidly has been some brash rhetoric? I want to pull up now what Chinese state media wrote in an op-ed earlier this week. Quote, the European Union has said bilateral trade with the U.S. should be balanced and mutually beneficial and that it will not negotiate under threat, nor will China. It will stand up to the U.S. bullying as necessary. And as a champion of globalization, free trade and multilateralism, it will have strong support from the international community. India has joined the U.S. and China as one of the world's five largest defense spenders, but the bulk of India's defense spend uh, is not on military equipment. Here's what the Indian military shells out the most on. time on the show. Thank you so much for watching us today. Countdown is up next. Stay tuned.